Good morning or good afternoon or whatever it is where you are. Uh, my name is Lewis Hinshaw. I'm a professor of radiology and neurology at uh, University of Wisconsin. I'm going to talk to you today about the basics of image-guided tumor ablation in the setting of um, abdominal oncology. Um, these are my in, uh, uh, disclosures. And we'll start by just uh, defining what ablation is. And if you look ablation up, you'll get kind of an interesting definition that has to do with both snow and ice as well as the surgical removal of body t tissue. But of course, that's not what we're discussing here today. Today, we're going to talk about image-guided tumor ablation, specifically the targeted destruction of tissue utilizing either thermal, chemical, or other means to create cellular necrosis of a soft tissue, usually of a mass or a tumor. It's generally applied with a specially designed needle that allows energy to be deposited in the tissues. Uh, and there are multiple different types of ablation. Uh, as discussed, chemical like ethanol can be utilized. Um, you can use uh, non-thermal mechanisms like IRE. Uh, but thermal ablation is by far the most common. It's what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, these are some of the ablation modalities that are available. Uh, radiofrequency ablation uh, was the workhorse of ablation for many years. Uh, but it's being uh, slowly replaced by microwave ablation, and I'll tell you why uh, as we go through our discussion today. Uh, cryoablation is also uh, used fairly commonly, uh, the utilization of cold. And then there's a whole litany of other ones that are either in development and or utilized clinically and um, uh, at various stages of utilization. Um, I'm going to focus on the top three today because those are the most common. Um, but I will uh, kind of mention some of the other ones as we go through. So here's the concept of image-guided tumor ablation. You place your uh, needle into the tumor uh, and you apply energy to that uh, tumor to create an ablation zone. Uh, the energy applied, as discussed previously, is uh, based upon the energy that you're utilizing for the uh, uh, procedure. And it, and it all kind of varies um, what energy you're placing. But the energy application is designed to create an ablation zone with a margin of uh, a normal tissue. Um, you may need multiple applicators if you have a larger tumor, and you should plan for ablation zones large enough that uh, you do get that adequate uh, margin. Because the challenge is, if you're a little bit off, which we frequently are, uh, you uh, want enough margin of error that you make sure that you uh, completely treat the tumor. In addition, some tumors will have uh, infiltrative margins, and thus you may not be uh, quite aware of exactly where your margins are. The reality is if you choose too small of an ablation zone, it's very easy to have residual tumor and, uh, and fail your treatment. And this is by far uh, the most challenging portion of this uh, procedure, which is to make sure you don't leave behind residual tumor. In addition, you have to understand the realities of our equipment, geometry, and limitations. And specifically, uh, when you look at the uh, tumor ablation zones that we obtain, they're, off, they're usually not circular. They're often ovoid. And so you have to realize that your adequate ablation zone really needs to be in the short axis dimension of whatever uh, your ablation zone looks like. So if you, uh, you may have a much larger ablation zone in one axis in order to get that adequate uh, coverage. But once again, being a little bit off, if you have that adequate margin, allows you to get, still get a complete treatment. Whereas if you have a relatively small ablation zone for the tumor that you're treating, especially in that short axis, uh, it's relatively easy, once again, to have residual tumor. So you really, the most important concept of this, just like with carpentry, you measure twice and cut once, and you have to make sure that you plan an adequate ablation zone in order to get the treatment that you want and desire. So um, just to look at this uh, in real life, in, in video, uh, this is uh, uh, showing you the power of multiple applicators. So on the left, we have a single microwave antenna. On the right, we have two microwave antennas. And if you look at the tumors that you're treating, um, a lot of times the most biologically active component is in the outer margin, or outer rim of the tumor with central necrosis in the center. And so in getting a, an adequate treatment means that you want to apply the energy to the uh, biologically active component. As you watch this video run, you'll note two things. One, look how much bigger and more confluent the ablation zone is with multiple applicators in compared, as compared to a single applicator. 
And two, look at where the energy is deposited at the periphery of the tumor quite adequately. Whereas if you had a tumor here, you can see at the peripheries, you would have relatively low temperatures. Considering the fact that it's most important to obtain uh, temperatures of 60 degrees Celsius in the tumor itself with uh, heat-based ablation, it's really important that you apply that energy and get those temperatures uh, throughout the periphery of the tumor um, and uh, always the central portion of the tumor, if your applicators are close enough, will uh, reach those t temperatures. With cryoablation, you can also place multiple uh, cryoprobes, and when you have them together, there's a very active and powerful synergy that allows you to create large confluent ice balls. And, uh, con and once again, considering that the real uh, goal of cryoablation is to get negative 40 degrees or colder, and to have multiple th freeze-thaw cycles, uh, the synergy of multiple cryoprobes is quite important. So here's our current indications, and uh, as an aside, I am also giving a lecture for the SIR, uh, specifically on the ablation modality, so uh, you can go to that lecture um, as well if you want more information on the different modalities. Um, but for now, I'm going to focus on uh, our current indications, what we utilize this for. And as you can see, the list is relatively long, uh, and there's even some that aren't on here. But I'm going to focus on liver tumors, kidney tumors, lung tumors, soft tissue tumors, and bone tumors. And within liver, there's multiple uh, different types, including benign subtypes. Uh, within uh, ki kidney, the same thing. You have primary renal cell carcinoma, but you can also treat benign tumors like angiomyelopomas. Um, lung tumors are a little bit more um, uh, controversial in some ways because SBRT is such a powerful uh, tool for those patients, um, but there's definitely indications for us in, in, in the lung as well. And then soft tissue tumors including uh, lymph nodes and then osteoastiomas and metastatic disease to the bone. And I'm going to show you some examples from these different categories and discuss uh, different things that we do while we're doing ablation. Uh, here's a, the first example. This is an older gentleman with a 3-centimeter hepatocellular carcinoma. You're all hopefully familiar with imaging findings with a brisk arterial enhancement on the arterial phase and washout and a pseudocapsule on the portal venous phase. Um, so no biopsy is needed here. This is diagnosed based upon the imaging alone. And this is by far our most accepted uh, indication, which is hepatocellular carcinoma in a patient with cirrhotic liver. And the reason is because we can be relatively precise. We can get a complete treatment with a uh, very high rate of local uh, tumor control and uh, complete tumor necrosis. Complete tumor necrosis is important for multiple reasons in these patients, not the least of which is one of their biggest uh, uh, reasons for failure is uh, that you uh, don't get complete tumor necrosis and then you get either intrahepatic spread uh, comma, uh, local recurrence, or you have um, uh, patients who are going to transplant, and there's been um, a lot of studies that have shown that getting complete necrosis is associated with a lower risk of recurrence after transplant. So complete tumor necrosis is very important. So you can see this quite well with ultrasound. That's how we do our guidance. You can see right next to the tumor, there is a hepatic vein uh, that's going to act as a heat sink this would be problematic for radiofrequency ablation, which is susceptible to heat sinks, but not so much for microwave ablation. And you'll see we put in two antennas, one along that medial margin uh, to uh, uh, account for that heat sink, and one along the lateral margin. And this is what it looks like when you perform the ablation. You can monitor it with ultrasound. You can see the gas cloud that occurs. And this gas cloud has been shown to fairly closely be associated with the ablation zone. So it's usually about, it usually underestimates the ablation zone just slightly because this is your, uh, essentially your boiling uh, point, uh, your gas or your steam that you're creating. And so there will be some tissue outside of this that's generally destroyed, but it's relatively minimal. And this is what it looks like on CT. Here's the pre-ablation um, uh, appearance. Here's a CT with the two antennas in place within the tumor. And then this is the post-ablation. You can see we've got a fairly large ablation zone here. Uh, you know, this is a three centimeter tumor with HCC. We want about a five millimeter margin at least. So we should plan for at least a four centimeter ablation zone. This is probably a little over four, about four and a half. And, uh, and that's uh, perfectly adequate. And you can tell that it's centered well over the area of the uh, previous tumor. 
Now, you just have to be familiar with your equipment and what it provides you because you need to plan for uh, ablation zones. This is your ablation zone size. So keep in mind that if it's a ablation zone size of two and a half centimeters, if you want a full centimeter, then you need a four and a half centimeter ablation zone, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you have to take that into account as you're planning your ablation. And this is what should be possible with current uh, uh, techniques. Um, this is a, a study that we published in JVIR. And what you'll see is uh, excellent local control uh, in the region of single digits, uh, between 6 and 7% in this case, uh, which is really important because you need to have uh, that excellent local control in order to compete with some of the other uh, uh, possible uh, therapies. And uh, some people worry about complication rate with microwave, but you can see uh, even though you have a fairly powerful tool, uh, because of techniques that we've developed over the years, you can have a very safe tool uh, with a very low complication rate, even in these relatively sick patients. And local tumor progression really does make a difference in overall survival. So here's this, the curves uh, from local tumor progression with microwave versus RF. And here's the split associated with that in the overall survival. So it really does matter uh, that you get better local control and complete tumor necrosis. Um, but these are the kind of uh, numbers that should be feasible. Once again, utilizing ablation to, as a bridge to transplant, this is a common uh, indication because most of these patients, if they are uh, appropriate, will, uh, will ultimately go on to transplant because it is the ultimate cure for their disease. If you leave that uh, liver in, they often get recurrent disease in other portions of the liver. And so uh, this is the only way to truly cure what's going on with their liver. Um, and this is a, a nice study done um, uh, at uh, UCLA showing a retrospective analysis with a large volume of liver transplantation. RFA is initial standalone bridge therapy, and they these are their primary endpoints. And what you'll see is they had a, an excellent low dropout rate despite very long wait times in the order of uh, several years in many cases with a 7.4% disease-specific dropout. That's excellent. In addition, uh, the uh, long-term recurrence-free and overall survival was, was, was very good with a 71% overall survival at eight years, which is exceptional. Uh, and there was a very low uh, major complication rate. So uh, a, a great way to bridge patients to transplant um, and, uh, and keep these tumors under control. So now I'm going to uh, show you a case of metastatic disease to the liver. This is a 57-year-old female who has metastatic breast cancer. Uh, she had a rapidly growing uh, mass right here next to the IBC. And, uh, and there, this was uh, uh, sent to us to be considered for ablation. Um, once again, to be honest, if this was in the era of radiofrequency ablation, I'd be a little bit um, uh, pessimistic about our chances of curing this because uh, of its proximity to the IVC and its associated heat sink. But with microwave, we can overcome these heat sinks and, uh, and should be able to adequately treat this. This is also a relatively large tumor. You can see about three and a half centimeters. As metastatic disease, you want at least a one centimeter uh, margin. And so you need to get at least a five and a half centimeter ablation zone. That's a challenge with a lot of the ablation technology, um, but the newer microwave systems are capable of that. So we put three antennas into this patient. You can see one I placed almost directly on top of the IVC, and that's to kind of overcome that uh, heat sink uh, uh, component of that, as well as two others in uh, kind of the medial and then one along the inferior margin. And here's the post-ablation uh, appearance. This is immediately after the ablation, so you can see some gas bubbles within the ablation zone, as well as some of this higher attenuation uh, material, which is just very desiccated tissue. And this ablation zone measured up to about, about six centimeters and uh, was perfectly adequate for coverage. And one important thing to note is that it goes right up to and uh, kind of touches the IVC, uh, therefore not sparing tumor along that margin. Now, uh, this is three years later. So this patient is now actually about six years out and doing quite well. And you can see uh, no avidity on the uh, PET. Um, ablation for liver metastases. This is one uh, study that people tend to quote a lot, which is the CLOCK trial. And this is actually a randomized controlled uh, phase two trial, which we have very few of. And this looked at systemic therapy alone versus systemic therapy plus aggressive local treatment with uh, in this case, RFA plus or minus resection as needed. And long-term results were uh, kind of their goal. And uh, this is what they saw. Uh, you can see there's a 
fairly significant split in hepatic progression. This is the um, arm with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the aggressive treatment with systemic therapy plus local regional therapy and surgical resection. And this is the, uh, the arm without the, the uh, local regional and surgical resection. You can see what a significant difference there is in hepatic progression. And in addition, this once again did have a significant effect on overall survival. So here we are actually 10 years out with an overall survival in uh, around 30%, which is exceptional. So it really does very much support um, the uh, aggressive application of ablation in these patients with oligometastatic disease. That being said, there are some issues with the uh, de trial design uh, that people uh, uh, are not completely happy with, but overall this uh, does support utilizing it uh, quite aggressively. You can uh, kind of do the same thing with other uh, metastatic disease. This is a, a, a trial performed at our institution uh, looking at percutaneous microwave ablation for renal cell carcinoma metastatic to other sites. And this is uh, sites other than liver, including lymph nodes and things like that. Um, and one of the big potential uh, benefits of this is uh, allowing the uh, clinician, uh, the uh, referring clinician, to delay the uh, 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 utilizing systemic therapies on these patients because they have such high costs. A lot of these patients are on some of the newer therapies, the anti-angiogenic therapies, and they're uh, extremely expensive. And so if we can utilize ablation to uh, s delay the onset of those therapies, you can have significant savings to the systems, uh, to the system. So this is uh, just another example of how you can push off and, uh, and improve survival with uh, utilizing this uh, technique. So in this study, we had 93% local control with a very low uh, complication rate. And here is uh, an example from that paper showing you these uh, metastatic retroperitoneal lymph nodes right next to the IVC. Um, some people would be uh, worried about bleeding and, uh, and damaging the IVC, but the reality is it kind of self-protects. And here is the uh, post-ablation finding after uh, treating this uh, lymph node. Excellent results are uh, definitely uh, feasible. And also, uh, you know, the ability to get these large safe ablations has uh, changed the game, especially for these uh, benign tumors. Hemangiomas, adenomas, and cysts are the ones I'm going to kind of discuss here today. And it's really a, a really important consideration for these patients, particularly adenomas. Uh, these tend to be young uh, female patients, and they tend to get very large morbid surgeries for what is a truly benign process. And if we can treat these with ablation, we're really doing them a huge favor. Hemangiomas are a little bit less common, but, uh, but can be a very powerful tool. And then cysts are uh, uh, something that I'm uh, just going to touch on here and say that we can treat these. Uh, it tends to work best if you do a combination drainage and ablation simultaneously. Um, but uh, it's a little bit less uh, described. So here's a patient with a very large symptomatic hemangioma. This is a 45-year-old construction worker, and he had kind of debilitating back pain related to this. You can see it's probably actually causing some change in the perfusion of the adjacent liver and uh, maybe even some atrophy, and uh, it measures uh, th up to 14 centimeters almost. So too large to realistically get every cell. So if this was a cancerous uh, lesion, I wouldn't consider it uh, an, an, an appropriate indication, but as a benign tumor where your challenge is to control mass effect and, uh, and, and, th and ha you have different goals of treatment, this seems like a very reasonable application. So here is the procedure itself. You can see that um, we put in three what are called LK antennas. We placed them at, uh, I did uh, put them a little bit deeper so that they're at the deep margin before I uh, started to burn. And then I did multiple uh, burns as I pulled the antennas back. Uh, I did three different, burn, three different burns in two different locations. And uh, this was the final result. So this is immediately post ablation. And what you can see is if you look at the volume, the volume has been cut in half. And that's because there is significant tissue contraction that occurs with uh, heat-based ablations, particularly microwave with the very high temperatures. And you can see there's probably a little bit of residual tumor along the margin. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is my goal was not to get in a complete treatment, but to decrease the mass effect. This patient actually hasn't been imaged again because they're now about five years out. 
and they've had durable pain relief, since it's a, a benign tumor, there really isn't any reason to uh, re-image the patient. So unfortunately, we haven't for purposes of academics, but, um, but uh, the patient's doing well, which is the most important thing. There's a lot of uh, different um, publications out there on utilizing ablation for these patients, and all of them show uh, good results, uh, although it's not certainly uh, perfect. There are patients that do have residual pain at times. Here's a patient with an hepatic adenoma at the dome of the liver. You can see there's actually a resection margin because this patient had another adenoma previously resected. Um, and once again, to me, this is one of the best indications for ablation because this is a patient that otherwise, well, in this case, has already had surgery and may or may not have other uh, surgical opportunities. But in our case, and in, in, at our institution, I'm working very hard to get them to send these patients to us primarily because we can get excellent results uh, with minimal morbidity, uh, much less than a large uh, surgery. So here we are. We uh, place three antennas in the uh, in the in the hepatic adenoma, and this is the post ablation image. And you can see excellent result with no residual tumor. Uh, we have published this now: twelve adenomas, all up to, up to eight point three centimeters in size. No, uh, all successfully ablated, no significant complications. And there are some other uh, publications out there now looking at this with, once again, excellent results. Um, renal cell carcinoma is a growing indication for uh, ablation. Um, cryoablation has historically been the workhorse in the, in the kidney, but the reality is, is that there are some uh, definite um, benefits of microwave ablation, most significantly time, even though um, it doesn't seem much of a difference, five minutes versus 25 minutes, for example, which is a typical cryoablation um, treatment. Uh, the time does become significant when you're talking about patients who are under anesthesia, uh, taking up time in your CT suite, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we've actually changed the number of patients that we can get through in a day uh, based upon changing from cryoablation to microwave ablation. Now, the challenge is that sometimes with the kidney, you're working in a fairly tight space and you can have vulnerable structures close by. So in this case, you can see the small bowel, it's collapsed here, but it's right up against the anterior margin of this tumor within the inferior pole of the right kidney. Uh, this is a biopsy proven renal cell carcinoma. Historically, we would have taken this to the operating room and done this laparoscopically, but we've developed techniques uh, where we can cause displacement of that tumor from the vulnerable structure. And here's uh, me performing hydrodissection to displace the small bowel in such a way that it allows me to have some room, more than adequate room, as you can see, uh, to treat this tumor safely. Uh, so here we are putting our microwave antenna in and treating that tumor. And here's the post-ablation uh, image. You can see the enhancing renal cortex but non-enhancement of the tumor and a small margin. With renal cell carcinoma, you want about a five millimeter margin, but the reality is that if you look at surgical literature, patients actually do quite well, even with a microscopically positive margin. Not that we want to aim for that, but uh, realize that your margin is a little bit less important with renal cell carcinoma. Once again, protecting the adjacent structures with uh, hydrodissection, which we use in about 40% of our kidney cases, and a smaller but still significant component of our liver cases. So here's some of the uh, recent uh, literature from microwave ablation for the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, local tumor progression of 6.2% and 1% with all but one of those retreated with uh, excellent results. So low complication rate and 100% cancer specific survival with follow-ups in the three to four year range at this point, um, which is quite good. Uh, compare that to cryo, which shows a local tumor progression depending on which study you look at between five and 40%. There's a huge range, par partly because there's more literature and more numbers, um, but uh, in our experience, um, it has been slightly higher with cryoablation as compared with microwave ablation uh, for local tumor progression as well. Um, and then let's transition to lung. So lung is an indication that has been uh, a little bit of a challenge for us because SBRT, our radiation therapy, does have a fairly strong um, foothold in this area. Um, they are uh, sell themselves as completely non-invasive and, uh, and fairly highly effective, and to some degree they are uh, relatively effective. If you look at local, uh, well, they call it 
they actually define their control differently than we do. We essentially uh, define uh, any evidence that there's incomplete treatment as a local failure, whereas they essentially utilize the resist criteria. And as long as it doesn't progress in size locally, uh, they consider that a, a, a success, even if there's tumor still there um, and or they get metastatic disease elsewhere. So uh, it makes it a little bit challenging to compare our literature. Um, and the other component of that, of course, is that SBRT is anything but non-invasive. They are bombarding uh, the body with radiation and doing secondary damage, uh, particularly to the underlying lung parenchyma, and patients can have very significant radiation-induced lung damage. But, um, but all that being said, uh, this is a fairly typical case where we, were at, we uh, got this um, uh, patient referred to us. This is a patient who has um, about a two centimeter uh, lung nodule uh, that's biopsy proven uh, non-small uh, cancer. And uh, we did this under conscious sedation. A lot of times these patients do not have significant pain if it's not uh, adjacent to the visceral pleura. Um, and so you can see I've uh, uh, advanced the needle through the tumor um, and probably a little bit too deep um, but here I am performing the ablation. You can kind of see a little bit of uh, gas and ground glass opacity uh, developing around that. But once again, I'm probably a little too deep and I'm probably a little bit on the uh, posterior margin. And so what I did was reposition that needle uh, along the medial margin and a little bit more superficial. I repeated the uh, short ablation uh, about three minutes. And, uh, and you can see this ground glass opacity develop around the tumor with a nice margin. And so this is a fairly typical case where we can get a, a very uh, adequate treatment uh, with very low morbidity. This patient had essentially no symptomatology afterwards with a, a procedure done under conscious sedation. Um, here's a more typical case that we tend to get in this day and age simply because uh, SBRT is so powerful, which is that they uh, do fail, um, and when they do fail, they often have no other options because they generally, the patients that get SBRT are not surgical candidates, so this patient can't go to surgery. And because of the radiation-induced lung damage and damage to the adjacent structures, they're no longer eligible for um, uh, additional radiation. So in this case, uh, you can see all this very extensive radiation-induced lung damage here. Uh, which makes it very challenging at times to differentiate background uh, uh, lung fibrosis from recurrent tumor. So in these patients, we almost always get a, a, C, a PET CT scan to show us where the PET avid tumor is located so that we can treat this. Um, and so we can see there's two areas of uh, recurrence, uh, which we target with our microwave ablation antennas. And you can see this is the lower, more inferior component. This is that higher, more uh, crescentic uh, area of uh, recurrence. You can see a fairly large, so we've got three antennas in here, and there's a fairly large zone of ablation, which is actually what we want in these patients because the reality is when they occur in that fibrotic bed, once again, it's a little bit challenging to identify the tumor, and uh, they tend to have more infiltrative growth pattern. So we want to make sure that we can uh, get that uh, treated. Um, the ground glass opacity does uh, indicate your ablation zone, um, but there's two things about that. One, it takes a little while to develop, so you have to wait 10 to 15 minutes after the procedure. And two, if you, if you get hemorrhage into the area, it can be challenging to differentiate from your ablation zone. So here we are three years later, and you can see the patient's developed cavitation. That's a fairly common uh, complication uh, within the lung and patients who have ablation. Of all modalities, it's a little bit higher with microwave, but that's actually probably because it's a little bit more effective. There's been studies that have shown cavitation is associated with a better oncologic outcome. This patient had, did have asymptomatic aspergilloma formation, but otherwise was doing quite well and uh, did not have any evidence of recurrent disease at this time. Um, so uh, uh, quite a success. Uh, people have studied this fairly specifically, looking at uh, uh, radio frequency ablation. In this case, the Rapture trial is fairly well known. Uh, there are limitations to radio frequency in the lung that are even uh, higher than some of the other organs uh, related to high resistance to electrical current flow within air. But uh, despite that, they actually got uh, excellent results with an 88% local control, 
uh, with one treatment and near 100% with two treatments. Can cancer specific uh, two year survival of 82% is in line with a lot of the other uh, treatments uh, applied in these stage 1A, uh, in these, these patients with stage 1A non small cell carcinoma, 92% at two years, which is excellent. Uh, there has been a direct comparison, sub-lobal R resection to microwave ablation. This is a relatively small uh, study, but 54 patients versus 108. And uh, comparing lobectomy versus microwave, you can see the overall survival and disease-free survival actually correlate quite well, uh, considering how uh, minimally invasive microwave ablation is compared to lobectomy. That's an excellent result. Um, the only thing that did correlate with overall survival, and not surprisingly, is size. So if you uh, differentiate these by patients that have s tumors that are less than three centimeters versus uh, greater than three centimeters, you can see there's a differentiation in overall survival. Uh, but once again, if you do that same thing and look at size as it correlates with, um, with the treatment applied, it doesn't really matter if it's microwave or lobectomy, which is an excellent result. In the future, we do uh, uh, have uh, ways to uh, improve our results. Uh, combination with other therapies is one way to uh, really uh, create the uh, synergy between the different applications that we have. Uh, Transarterial chemomization, Y90, SBRT, all these things are being used in combination with ablation and quite uh, powerfully. Uh, and then there are some medical adjuncts that you can utilize as well, um, some of which have uh, not really panned out in human uh, trials, even though they look promising in animal trials, and uh, a lot more work to be done there. Uh, just to kind of show you the power of applying multiple um, different uh, treatment modalities in patients with uh, challenging disease, this is a patient with a very large HCC in the liver. Uh, you can see here in the superior dome. Um, in addition, has a very large biopsy-proven metast adrenal metastatic uh, focus on the left. So we did uh, fairly extensive treatment on this patient. We did a transarterial chemolization followed by microwave ablation of the liver HCC primary, and then we did a cryoablation of the adrenal metastatic disease. Uh, this is three-month follow-up, and you can see complete devascularization and excellent look in the, HC in the liver as well as within the adrenal gland. This patient is actually now about four years out and has no evidence of disease um, uh, and uh, is uh, being considered for a, an exception to get on the transplant list. Uh, highly doubtful he'll actually get it, but we kind of hope for. And then uh, to look at uh, uh, bone treatment, uh, ablation really is the treatment of choice for patients with osteodosteoma, even in challenging locations. This would be a very morbid surgery if they, if they tried to go in and do, and do a surgical uh, therapy for this, um, but you can uh, kind of work around the, um, the uh, fibula and get an excellent window into this and, and do a, a quick treatment. Uh, most people still use radiofrequency ablation for this, but there's uh, developing evidence that microwave ablation is safe as well. Uh, you can also use it for metastatic disease. Um, this is a patient with a large um, focus of metastatic disease in the pelvis with debilitating pain. Uh, you can see it likely related to it eroding the uh, bone of the pubis. Uh, and this is, we, we often use cryoablation in these patients, patients because of the ability to control it fairly precisely. You can see the ice ball very well, and you can control the margins and uh, where it extends uh, fairly closely. We utilized eight cryoprobes in here to get a very, in this patient, to get a very large ablation zone measuring up to about uh, 10 or 11 centimeters. And you can see one of the important things is to incorporate the margins that include the bone in your ablation zone. Uh, this patient's uh, pain was well controlled. It slowly turned down over the course of about three months, which is fairly typical. And then, um, and then uh, the, it was well controlled until the patient passed about uh, nine months later. Uh, there have been a lot of studies done, mostly out of Mayo, uh, showing excellent results with this, with trending, uh, pain trending down uh, and then uh, durable uh, local pain control. So in conclusion, ablation is a rapidly advancing technique that is really quickly gaining acceptance for um, treatment of some liver and renal tumors in particular. It's, uh, in fact, the standard of care for uh, uh, small uh, liver tumors, HCC, uh, if you look at the BCLC guidelines. 
and uh, and urologists are becoming much more accepting of utilizing it for small renal tumors uh, as an alternative to either active surveillance or partial nephrectomy. Uh, the other indications are definitely expanding, and we're getting more traction in lung, soft tissue, and benign tumors. Benign tumors, as I discussed earlier, is, I think, one of the perfect indications for this technology because you do have a wide window of opportunity for treatment. So even if you don't get all of the tumor in one setting, you can always go back, and it's so much less morbid than a lot of the other alternatives. Over time, you'll see if you look through the literature, our outcomes are definitively improving as our techniques and our equipment improve. And microwave ablation in particular has been kind of a, a big uh, advancement that has allowed us to do things that we couldn't do previously. Um, the future is very bright for this minimally invasive therapy, and hopefully you'll all be a part of it. Uh, you'll certainly be reading the imaging and follow-up, even if you're not performing the procedure. And uh, it's important to understand what those post-ablation images look like. Um, so uh, definitely uh, make sure you educate yourself on that. Thank you very much.